masters. And then he worked as a postdoc at Dartmouth College. And um, Akshay is interested in interpreting spatial and other data from sedimentary environments to kind of decipher how life and the environment co-evolved through time, broadly speaking. Is that a reasonable summary? It's very reasonable. Yeah. And um, after his postdoc at Dartmouth, he came here. And he is, in fact, the new since January, a new assistant professor in the Department of Earth and Space Sciences, and he's interested in joining and contributing to the astrobiology program. So take it away. Awesome. Thank you, David. Um, great. Thank you all for coming. Thank you for attending my talk. I had some great meetings today and some really insightful um, discussions. So, as David mentioned, I am a sedimentologist and geobiologist, and generally I'm interested in probing the sedimentary rock record to understand how life and environment have evolved on our planet. And I do this probing using a combination of quantitative computational and spatial analyses. So that's generally what my research is. I think it's important in the context of astrobiology to sort of reframe my research and one of the biggest things I'm interested in is trying to detect, interpret, and then validate biosignatures, especially through the lens of morphology. So using morphology and those computational and quantitative and spatial techniques I talked about before to try to understand where, whether specific features were built by life or not. And I wanna point out that the identification or the misidentification of biosignatures has been a challenge for a very long time. And to make this point, I'm going to tell you about Charles Darwin, Darwin's dilemma, and then the dawn animal of Canada. So when Darwin first wrote Origin of Species, he had a problem. Essentially, there were no pre-Cambrian fossils in the record. As far as Darwin was concerned, when the Cambrian emerged about 540 million years ago, complex life just appeared on our planet. Now, that's not in line with his theory of evolution. And so what Darwin proposed was that if his theory was in fact correct, the Precambrian seas swarmed with living creatures. And it turned out almost immediately after Darwin published Origin of Species that these Precambrian creatures, these fossils of such Precambrian creatures emerged. And this was known as Eozoon canadense. So I'm just showing you an imprint from an 1865 paper. And Eozoon was thought to be a giant foraminifera. Um, and almost immediately, people started to argue that this actually wasn't a biological fossil at all. That debate raised for 50 years. And what people ended up doing was actually looking at the morphology of Eozoon, trying to understand whether the canals that they thought they saw within this construction match the canals that they might see in a modern foreign. And eventually, it turned out that people argued on the basis of morphology that Eozoon was not a biological construction at all. The nail in the coffin for Eozoon was when uh, researchers found examples of the same kind of limestone rock on the slopes of Mount Vesuvius. And there, people started to realize that actually Eozoon was a mechanical construction that was produced when igneous uh, rocks and intrusions interacted with limestone. So today we know this not to be a biological signature at all. But it's not just Eozoon and the 1800s debates that we have to worry about when we think about morphology and when we think about biosignatures. So some of you in this room might be familiar with this Martian meteorite and the argument, this is a paper from 1996, and this argument that these sort of carbonate blebs represent something that may have been produced by bacteria. Now, this specific meteorite has been debated over. We more or less agree that these things are not biological or can be formed abiotically. But generally what I'm interested in looking at is are the uses of morphology to determine whether or not specific biosignatures are in fact biotic. I operate on multiple scales. So while I might be looking at millimeter to micron scale enigmatic ediacaran organisms, I also have looked at the three-dimensional morphology of mountain scale reef geometries. And most recently, I've been really interested in thinking about statistical geochemistry, so on planetary scales, and trying to understand how we might evaluate uncertainties within our records and still produce meaningful time trends. And if you're interested at all in these other, these latter two projects or these lines of research, I'm more than happy to talk about them. But today, given that this is an astrobiological uh, audience, I'm actually going to focus 
on analyzing ED acronym in organisms. And I'm going to show you how I use morphology in two different vignettes to determine the biological affinity of these really ancient animal forms. And to do so, I'm going to start with this photograph. This was taken on Salient Mountain in the Canadian Rockies. I've drawn a yellow line, and in the foreground is a glacier, and as this glacier has been retreating, it's been exposing these 540 million year old rocks, these microbial mounds, which you see in the foreground. Sorry, the background is a glacier yeah. retreating. Right? Yeah. <laughs> and so if you were to look very carefully at the microbial mounds up front, you would find fossils that people think to be the Earth's first biomineralizing uh, organisms. And generally, when we think about reefs through time, what you have to understand is that these reefs have been built up of microbially mediated constructions for most of Earth's history. So stromatolites and thrombolites, terms that you may be familiar with, have been the predominant builders of reefs in our planet's past. At some point in our planet's past, animals started building calcified shells and they started fusing those shells together to produce rigid frameworks. And these rigid frameworks are way different from the microbial reefs that preceded them. They have high topographic relief. Since they are pretty rigid, they can grow in places where microbes simply can't. They also have what's known as structural complexity. And one thing I'm interested in understanding is when metazoan framework reefs first emerged on our planet, and then what the environmental and evolutionary impacts of such reefs were. So I just mentioned structural complexity. So if any of you have ever looked at a modern coral reef, you notice that there are a lot of nooks and crannies. And in fact, people have done a lot of work demonstrating that these nooks and crannies lead to increased biodiversity. So one thing that you might consider is that when metazoan framework reefs first emerged, they may have lit the fuse for further diversification. So one thing I'm interested in doing is trying to find when the first metazoan framework reefs appeared on our planet. And to do so, I need to look deep into Earth history and all I'm showing you is a simple timeline. I've divided it into four eons, the Hadean, Archean, Proterozoic, and Phanerozoic. I'm interested at this moment between the Proterozoic and the Phanerozoic, right between the Ediacaran and Cambrian eras. So the Cambrian is a really interesting time period in our planet's past. It occurred about 540 million years ago. And it was the first time that animals started to engineer their environments. So just like human beings are doing today, they started churning up the, the bottoms of the oceans, they started building large structures, and they generally change Earth's biogeochemical cycles. Amongst these animals were the archaeocyathid sponges. And these sponges are calcifying organisms that built Earth's first framework reefs. And I'm showing you this reconstruction by Rachel Wood from 1999. And I really like this reconstruction because it sort of demonstrates a lot of the aspects of framework reefs that I was telling you about. So not only are they the rigid constructions of sponges that are growing upwards and adding topographic relief, but they're also these little nooks and crannies, these little refugia in which other organisms might be living and evolving. But were archaeocyathids the first framework reef builders on our planet? To answer this question, we need to look even further back in time, and we have to look for some of Darwin's living creatures. If we go all the way back in time to the earliest organisms that ever grew on our planet or built things on our planet, we'd be thinking about microbes approximately three and a half billion years ago, although that number tends to shift whether or not you believe certain examples of stromatolites or thrombolites in the rock record. These microbes built constructions like this one. This is a stromatolite from modern day Shark Bay in Australia, but generally now they're basically eaten up by any organism that wants to eat them. And so they only grow in hypersaline environments. One part that I find really interesting about stromatolites and thrombolites and microbially mediated constructions is that they appear, at least in the rock record, to change morphology on the basis of setting. So what I'm showing you is a figure from Paul Hoffman's 1974 paper in which he was looking at Great Slave Lake, which is a set of rocks from 1.9 billion years ago. And what Paul was showing is if you went around to different regions of that same setting, the stromatolites seem to be building completely different constructions. And he argued that this is probably due to water depth. That's probably the major control on these. I'm going to return to what we think about microbial morphology at the very end of the talk. But I just want to say that even if these organisms that are producing these are called simple, they're not just building simple forms. Some of the forms that they produce are rather complex. OK, microbes built microbial reefs. They did not build framework reefs. So now we move forward to think about other organisms that may have been able to build frameworks. About 2 billion years ago, people have argued that there were motile organisms. Here's a paper many people don't believe 
but argues that there were trace fossils in these rocks and that at least something was moving around. Once again, these things aren't building anything rigid. They're not building any frameworks. We might even move further ahead in time and we can start looking for the last common ancestor of eukaryotes. Problem is, while these are relatively abundant, once you start looking for them, they're incredibly small. All of these things are on the order of tens to hundreds of microns, and they're never really building anything rigid. So what we're left with is a time period right before the Cambrian, and we're left with a weird set of organisms known as the Ediacara biota. For the most part, the Ediacara biota are preserved as fine impressions in siliciclastic, so primarily sandstones. I'm just showing you a few examples of these impressions in these sandstones. And the Ediacaran biota are weird. And for the longest time, people weren't even sure if they were metazoan. So Schellacher in the 90s argued that actually these were weird pneumatic structures. They represented some form of nature's failed experiment in a, in a, in a body form that just didn't work. And that eventually na nature abandoned this, this line of, of construction and moved to the organisms that we know today. Recent work has demonstrated through biomarker data that at least some of these Ediacaran biota are actually metazoans, so that they are animals. I'm not interested in all the pneumatic constructions, however, because we know those things couldn't build a rigid framework. What I am interested in are three genera of biomineralizing or putatively biomineralizing Ediacaran organisms. So we have Namacolatus, Claudina, and Namapoikia. And in a moment, I'm going to actually walk through some reconstructions of these. But I'm going to start with the set of questions that I want to answer. First, I want to know what sort of organisms these Ediacaran putative biomineralizers were. What were their biological affinities? What were they actually doing in environments in which they're found? Secondly, I want to know whether or not they were actually building the rigid frameworks that I'm after, right? That's the major question I'm trying to answer. And in order to answer both of these questions, I'm going to argue that morphological analyses are required, and specifically morphological analyses that are done on three-dimensional reconstructions. And in order to make this last point, I'm going to tell you a little story about William Solis, who was a geologist at the turn of the century at Oxford. And in 1912, or sorry, 1902, Solis made a presentation to the Royal Society where he essentially lamented that paleontologists might be excuse, ex, uh, excused if they regard uh, the student of recent organisms with, with envy, because the student who looks at recent organisms can investigate things via serial sections. And what Solis was talking about here is, if you're studying something that has soft tissue, you can sharpen a knife really finely and you can make very thin sections through that tissue, right? Here's a mouse brain, just in successive serial sections. What's really cool is once you've done this, you can actually look at the relative position of different features within, this, uh, within these sections and then reconstruct the three-dimensionality. So if any of you have ever been to a bodies exhibit, that is essentially what they're doing, right? They're just making thin sections through human beings. Now, if you try to do the same thing with rock, you're going to either destroy your knife or you're going to crumble the rock, right? So it's not really doable. And Solis was pretty peeved. And he argued that actually people who are studying rocks and fossils within rocks are probably only getting a 10th of the information that they possibly could if they had access to three-dimensional information. And I know that sounds like hyperbole, but I want to argue that that's actually true. And in order to do so, I'm actually going to show you a reconstruction uh, and a photograph of our archaeocyathid in outcrop, taken by Ryan Mansick. So Ryan and I uh, were out in Nevada looking at some of these early archaeocyathid reefs, and we came across this one sample where you have archaeocyathids in the rock itself. The quarry gives you a sense of scale. And what I've done here is I've just drawn lines around individual uh, tubes of the archaeocyathid. Okay, if you are really talented, you might even notice that there is a branching organism here. So at least at the very least, we know that archaeocyathid seems to be a set of solitary circular elements, maybe some that were branching. Well, when you produce a three-dimensional reconstruction of those same archaeocyathids, you get a completely different story. These organisms were densely branching. They were building the sort of frameworks I was just telling you about but you'd never get that information just by looking at a single outcrop, insect, or outcrop section, right? Because you just have a random cross section through whatever these archaeos were doing. So anyways, I'll show you at the very end of the talk some of the work that Ryan's been doing with these 3D reconstructions. But just for now, I wanna demonstrate that sometimes three-dimensionality is really important. 
And one thing I do in my research is build synthetics. And in these synthetics, I try to understand what properties we might be able to extract from two-dimensional cross-sections about three-dimensional properties. And here, I'm just going to show you four uh, random synthetics. So if I'm interested in looking at tubular organisms, I might build these tubular organisms and randomly section them. If I'm interested in granular material, I might build a granular material in 3D and then randomly section it and try to understand how porosity or permeability might vary uh, based on what kind of section you get. I've also looked at crystalline solids, so things like granites, right? And then finally, I've looked at individual minerals. So I've looked at individual crystals. So when we're trying to say that a crystal is after some pseudomorph or is a pseudomorph after some mineral, how will we know whether or not we're right? Generally, the, the reality is, is that 3D properties cannot accurately be estimated from 2D cross sections. This is something that people have known for a very long time. But the reason I build these synthetics is because sometimes those errors are small enough that we don't actually care, right? So when we think about something like we might get a photograph of a putative microbial construction on Mars from a rover image, we don't actually have a choice to build a 3D model of it, but we might try to build a synthetic to understand how wrong our estimates might be of specific properties, right? So that's part of the value in building these synthetics. We really have to understand just how much error we can deal with. Anyways, when Solis was done lamenting, Solis built this machine. It's a serial grinding and imaging machine. Well, it's just a serial grinding machine. And what you do is you take a sample and you mount it to P over here. You lay down some diamond grit on D, and then you get a grad student to turn O until you've ground away some amount of material. Then they take a look at that freshly ground surface. They might take a photograph or a tracing. You make them stick it back on and then grind away a little bit more material at a time, right? So Solis was grinding away about a millimeter at a time. And he and his daughter, Igerna, Igerna was the first woman to study geology at Oxford, actually. They built these beautiful cross sections through these fossils. And so they did a whole bunch of reconstructions. And for me, one thing that I especially find interesting is that they built these analog models. So after they had done all of their cross sections, they then took beeswax and they carved out each section with the thickness corresponding to the amount of material that they left behind or that they ground away. And then they were able to produce these 3D models. And so this is a really nice analog version of what I'm going to show you today. Okay, so that is a very time consuming and destructive task. In the 1960s, it turned out that maybe we don't have to do that. Maybe we don't have to destroy rocks just to understand what's inside of them. And so if some of you in this room might be familiar with X-ray computer tomography, and the way that the X-ray computer tomography essentially works is you take a sample and you pass an X-ray beam through it. And because the features in the sample tend to attenuate X-rays differently, you get a projection. And that projection, if you rotate that sample uh, in slow increments, you can build a set of projections, and then you can use inverse methods to build a 3D model, right? So that's essentially how X-ray CT works. Now, the problem with X-ray CT is that you have to rely on density or material contrast, right? The reason that we can put our hand in an X-ray and get an X-ray out is because our bones are different than our blood vessels, right? They have different densities and materialities. But what happens if you don't have that much density or materiality difference? So here I'm showing you three samples. Uh, first in true color. So we have a oolite, which is just made up of calcium carbonate grains. There are only two phases in this oolite. There are the grains themselves in the air, and maybe a little bit of cement between the grains. We have a granite, which is made up of four phases. There are two feldspars in there, a quartz phase, and then a whole bunch of little mafic minerals, which are in, in dark black. And we finally, we have a carbonate. This is actually a cladina fossil. So I showed you the cladina before. The fossil's in white, the matrix is in black. Everything is recrystallized carbonate, however. So even though there is a difference in color and texture, there is no material difference if you were to look at it under a thin section. So when we look at X-ray CT, well, the OOIDs are pretty much imaged correctly. Air and carbonate have totally different densities, right? So not a big deal. The granite, well, we have a problem because the feldspars and the quartz actually have the same density. So they attenuate X-rays in similar ways. We lose a lot of materiality or material difference. By the time we get to the carbonate, since everything's recrystallized, maybe we're picking up a little bit of the dolomite in that carbonate rock. But really there's no way to reconstruct the fossil versus the matrix, right? Turns out that materiality and density are incredibly important and we rely on a lot of non-destructive techniques such as X-ray CT. And so there's still room to destroy rocks and build successive sections. 
And so I built a machine like this. And currently I have a grant out for building a machine like this at uh, the University of Washington. Essentially it's a computer controlled grinder. So it's just something that we can program. And then we just mounted a 80 megapixel or what is now 150 megapixel digital camera on its side. This camera is typically used for fashion photography, but it's really good for imaging the top of rocks. And the way this uh, machine works is we essentially program it and then we mount a sample on a metal plate and we grind away some amount of material, say 30 microns. The human hair is about 50 microns wide, so almost nothing. We're just polishing the top of this surface. Then the sample moves underneath the camera and we take an automatic photograph and we repeat this until we've destroyed the sample, but we end up with a stack of very high resolution images. I work on a whole bunch of image processing and machine learning and neural networks to actually isolate the fossils from the matrix or whatever other feature we're looking at. If you're interested, I'm happy to talk about those in more detail. But actually, I'm going to jump straight to looking at reconstructions of these organisms and evaluating what they're doing in the reefs in which they're found. I'm going to start with Namaklathus. And what I've done is just isolated individual Namaklathus in this rock. I know it's otherwise hard to see, but it is a goblet-shaped organism. And luckily, John Grotzinger and Wesley Waters reconstructed this in 2000. In fact, they manually ground away a sample to, to build this 3D model I'm showing you here. And it turns out the Namaklathus is actually a really flexible goblet-like organism. And if you see it when you go out to look at sedimentary environments, they tend to be folded over. So these things aren't rigid at all. They also just don't grow in large enough numbers to be building much of anything. They seem to be solitary organisms hanging around, weakly biomineralized at best. Next, we have Claudina. So Claudina are these tubular organisms. And what's really exciting about Claudina is that about seven years ago, researchers went out and actually measured some outcrops and demonstrated that these Claudina had preferential orientation. So it appeared that the Claudina in aggregate were oriented such that they were feeding in currents. Additionally, researchers demonstrated that these Claudina seem to cement together. And they occur in such large numbers that it seems reasonable that these things were actually building frameworks. So we set out to actually see what these frameworks look like. That was the reason we went out to find them, because it appeared that we had found Earth's earliest framework reef builders. So here I am with Adrian, Adrian Tassister Hart, who is now a graduate student at the University of California, Santa Barbara. And we're out in Namibia looking for these early framework reef systems. I'm just going to take one second to acknowledge the fact that all of the work I'm showing you today, including all of the work that I've done at universities, are done on traditional lands. It's just something to keep in mind. And it's actually a much bigger deal when we think about places like Namibia, where really the people who originally owned the land no longer have any say in it. Okay. Wherever we go, whether we go to Namibia or we go to Canada, we find Claudina in reef systems such as this. So we just find large microbial buildups. This is this large pinkish microbial buildup. When we walk up to these buildups, if we look carefully, we start to see fossils. So all the fossils are white here. And they're Claudina and Namaclathus right in these, it, it, making up these microbial mounds, right? So they are there in large numbers. If you were to look at an individual Claudina and reconstruct it, you would see this. It's a cup and cup structure. They are tubular. Sometimes they have ornamentation. Generally, it's thought that they were building hard shells and potentially they were building frameworks. Well, we can produce 3D reconstructions to test that. And so here's a reconstruction of the Claudina aggregate. So this is something that is only made up of Claudina and then some matrix material. And what should maybe strike you almost immediately is it doesn't seem that there is a single orientation and we can quantitatively demonstrate that no matter where we find Claudina in the world, no matter what aggregation we look at, they tend to be just jumbled up. It's really just a mess. This is a detritus flow. These Claudina aren't sitting there growing in situ. Instead, they're actually being washed into place. One really cool thing we can do is start to look at the cross sections of individual tubes and try to understand whether they are circular or elliptical. It turns out that most of these cross sections are elliptical, and that means that these tubes were deformed. We can then ask whether the orientation of the, of the long axis of the ellipse, whether all of those orientations are aligned. And in fact, they're jumbled up as well. So this isn't a compression that's due to burial after this rock was made, but in fact, these cloudina were being washed around and likely deformed en route to being deposited in some detrital pile, right? So these are the sort of information that we can extract from these data. And on the basis of these measurements, we argue that actually Claudina likely has a circulate uh, affinity or an analid affinity. So it's likely like a worm and most likely like circulates that you see today. So these circulated worms are built agglutinated 
tubes. They don't build hard shells. And the, this is an image from France, uh, from a lagoon. And essentially they do build bioherms, but these bioherms aren't rigid. And if you go up and try to squeeze any of these tubes, they'll just fall apart. They're just made up of agglutinated sediment stuck together by spit. So, you know, we made the statement that these things likely have an analyt affinity. And a few years later, using X-ray CT on a pyrotized sample, people found worm guts in one of these cladina and were able to confirm our, our estimate or our uh, affinity um, as association. And I think what's really powerful about, about this fact is that all we had left to work with were the tubes themselves. We had none of the original material and we still were able through comparative morphology to make a biological affinity uh, um, assignment. So I think that really demonstrates the power of using morphology in the rock record to understand biogenic forms. Okay, great. So that was Claudina. Next, I'm going to show you something that is a putative sponge, Namapoikia. Namapoikia grows in the same reefs as Claudina does. It looks like this. It's essentially just a labyrinthian construction. And Namapoikia is interesting for two reasons. One, because it may have been a framework reef builder. And if we know that the archaeocyathids were sponges, it might be interesting to find a Precambrian sponge that was building reefs. But two, th the reality is, is that the Precambrian sponge record is poorly, poorly understood and heavily debated. So here, all I've done is turn the timeline on its side here. We've got the Hadean, the Archean, Proterozoic, and Phanerozoic. We know that microbes started 3.5 billion years ago. We know from uh, from molecular clock data that metazones probably were around 700 million years ago, but we don't know much about what they were doing. There are no fossils of them. And since the sponges are basal metazoans, people argue that they, they must have been around very early and people have been searching for sponges for a very long time. Here are multiple records of putative sponge remains from the rock record. I've just put them within where they're found with, within the time scale. And the point I want to make is that every single one of these records, whether they're spicules, whether they're body fossils, are completely and totally debated. No one agrees that any one of these things is definitively a sponge. Among these are Namapoikia. So this was described by Rachel Wood in 2002. Here's another photo for it over here. Here's a dollar coin to show you the scale. But they do seem pretty regular. And Namapoikia does seem like it might be a sponge. It would be amazing to find out the Namapoikia sponge because one, it, it would give us the first definitive Precambrian sponge fossil in the rock record, but two, it would tell us a lot about how maybe metazoan framework reef building emerged within the lineages of sponges, right? So that's what we're after here. At least superficially, Namapoikia looks a lot like other sponges in the rock record. So I'm showing you Aperforata. Aperforata is a sponge from the Ordovician. It's what's known as an inazoan sponge. And on the left is a perforata. The canals are in black. The structure that the sponge builds is in white. On the right is Namapoikia. These are transverse cross sections. So if you just took an uh, organism growing up and you sliced it through, this is what you would see. One thing to point out is that both of these scale bars are one half centimeter. So Namapoikia is far, far, far larger than a perforata. What's interesting is even when we look at a longitudinal cross section through Namapoikia and a perforata, we see things that look at least superficially similar. It is not a stretch to imagine that this organism was in fact a sponge. So we want to evaluate it. And luckily, we have some proposed reconstructions to use as a basis for evaluation. So I'm just going to walk through this reconstruction. Namapoikia grew on some sort of microbial light substrate, which is in dark gray at the very bottom. It produced these partitions that grew upwards or outwards from the substrate. These partitions, as Namapoikia went upwards, over thickened towards the bottom and may have filled with cement. These partitions were cross cut by tabulae. And then finally, the sponge itself actually grew towards the top of the organism, right? So the sponge is always at the top, it's always growing upwards, it's always evacuating lower chambers. This reconstruction is likely based on other calcifying sponges that you see, including in the modern. This is Vasileta crypta. It's an analog for Namapoikia. I want you to look at that scale bar. That is 500 microns. This thing is absolutely tiny. But Vasileta crypta contains many of the features I just told you about. It's got partitions and tabulae. And indeed, if we look at the bottom, it seems like those partitions are being over thickened or filled with cement, right? So every single thing we've talked about. In a cross section, Vasileta crypta looks a lot like what we might expect Namapoikia to be doing. 
There are the living tissues in LT. And you also have these partitions that are growing upwards as well as these tabulae, right? So that's what we're looking for. One note about sponge morphology when, before we actually look at Namokoiki in 3D and compare it to some of these other sponges. Sponges essentially work by arraying cells known as cholanocytes. And these cholanocytes beat. As they beat, they move fluid across their collar cells and that's how they do their nutrient and gas exchange. Sponges work by arraying these cholanocytes together. And when sponges get bigger, they don't just make the canal chamber larger. They increase the sophistication of their canal system while maintaining a chamber size that doesn't grow too big. And it makes sense. These things are on the order of microns. They can only move so much water through. You can only erase so much of them. If you make your chamber too large, you're gonna end up with a stagnant amount of water in the center, right? It's just never gonna go anywhere. So sponges don't grow larger by just increasing chamber size. So that is something that we can test for. We get anomalously large chambers, probably not looking at a sponge. All right. I want to ask one additional question into, in addition to whether Namapoikyo is building a framework and whether or not it was a sponge. I want to know whether we can say anything about the way that Namapoikyo grew based on 3D reconstructions. So to study Namapoikyo, we go to look for it in the one place in the world where it's found, in Namibia. It's found in a single farm setting. And what we were able to do was me, Adrian, and my field assistant, Ray, is actually go out and do a survey of the reef in which Namapoikyo is found. And we looked at 2,000 individual locations on that reef. We basically just walked 10 meters and then, or five meters and then just observed what we saw. And over one week time period, which was incredibly boring, we built a map of the reef system. And what we were looking for at the end of the day were features such as these, these labyrinthian constructions that we thought were in situ Nymopoikia. We can use those data to build interpolated maps so that we can search for different features. So I've used the same set of uh, surveys to look for whether or not we, where microbial constructions are. We've even looked for how much Claudina were there to demonstrate that in fact, it's a very small proportion, even though you think you see it everywhere. But in the case of Namapoikia, what we're looking for is the probability of finding Namapoikia at some point of this reef. So the reef is dipping to the south uh, east about 45 degrees. So you're looking at an oblique cut. And in fact, there are only very few places in which you find Namapoikia. Uh, red means there's a 100% chance of finding it. Blue means there's a 0% chance of finding it. And indeed, the way that people describe Namapoikia is growing in Neptunian dikes. So in regions where the reef basically grew up, broke away due to gravity, and the Namapoikia is found within those spaces between those broken parts. So at least we know that we are missing where Namapoikia is. What we could do then is actually go take those samples and build three-dimensional reconstructions. I'm just showing you where a fracture sits. Stratigraphic up is pointing towards you. So that's the direction in which this organism is growing. What should strike you almost immediately is that we are missing any sort of tabulae. Those tabulae just don't exist. When you go looking for them, they're basically not there. Uh, and indeed, what Namapoikia looks like is a sheet-like organism, right? So these are sheets, vertical sheets that appear to coalesce, meander, uh, split. But there are no tabulae. And the other piece, to pull out here is that there's really not much regularity here. This doesn't look like a metazoic. There are these massive void spaces that just break apart the Namapoikia structure. So lest you think I picked one sample and that was the only sample I'm going to look at because it's my preferred one. We also used a sample that Brutzinger and, and West Waters actually collected in, in the 2000s and manually reconstructed. We applied our neural network imaging uh, processing techniques to this sample as well. So we have two comparative samples taken by two different research groups, two different locations of the reef. And so we can use them to do intrapopulation comparisons as well, right? And the first thing we might do is just look at measurements of the partitions, so the skeletal elements and the void spaces, the spaces around them. So here are distributions from Nama Poikia sample A and sample B. And we might just go out and look at all the calcareous sponges that we know in the rock record pick ones that we think are uh, illustrative of very specific morphological features and compare them. And so here we're just looking at the partition and void thicknesses of four different sponges, including one called Giganto discoforma. So that is the most, the biggest sponge ever seen in the rock record. And yet all of them fall within that blue bar here. So really Namapoikia is anomalously large compared to any sponge ever described in the rock record, including things that are extant and, and living today. And the other thing that Namapoikia lacks is regularity. So I mentioned that before, but I'm going to show you Aperforata in 3D as well. 
This is this Ordovician and its own sponge I was telling you about. Now, those chambers are incredibly regular. There's almost no deviation in the size of those chambers. And the partitions are also incredibly regular. There's almost no deviation in the size of those partitions. They're regular because this is a metazoan. And metazoans tend to have a set of rules that by which they build. And so that they don't just produce random void spaces throughout them, right? So this is a good comparison to see what we might expect in a real sponge, right? In a real calcifying sponge. Great, so not only do we not see that regularity, we can do other things with these models. We might go ahead and we might look at sub volume. So we might say, okay, well, these things aren't regular, but why don't we find the most regular parts of both of these uh, samples? And then just try to understand whether those at least look similar to each other. And in fact, the partitions and voids come from two totally different uh, distributions. You can show that statistically. And that's super weird. If you have two human beings, one who's, two feet tall and one who's eight feet tall, we don't expect their circulatory system to vary in, in, the, in the width of their circulatory system by an order of magnitude. That doesn't happen. A lot of other things scale, but we don't expect to see changes in just these really, really basic uh, parameters, right? So we're gonna argue that we don't actually see a metazoan at all. And the last thing we can do is try to decide, well, did Namapuikia grow the way we thought it grew? Does it thicken at the bottom and thin at the top? One of the samples does thin at the top, one actually thickens. So basically that's a wash. Neither one of these are statistically relevant. It seems that the proposed reconstruction really doesn't work. So how did Namapoikia grow? We're gonna propose this model in which we actually argue that what we're looking at is an aggregation. It's a result of iterative growth and has nothing to do with a single organism living like an animal that we might think of. So we have some time period zero where you have a partition that is a microbially mediated partition and it's surrounded by fill. At some time period one, there has been some meandering, but we also have some splitting because maybe you change the amount of sunlight where there's this, a change in sed flux and it sort of kills off a part of this ridge. At time two, you have a merging of another ridge that comes together and then maybe another splitting. And over time, what you build up is an aggregated growth that looks like it may have all existed at the same time, but actually took many uh, accretionary instances to produce. And within this context, Namapoikia is growing in this reef system within these depositional cracks. It's, there's a reason why it's only found in certain cracks, likely due to uh, its surrounding microbial constructions, as well as sort of environmental conditions. And this is where Namapoikia would be growing quietly somewhere. Lest you think I'm totally out to lunch, I'm just making this up. It turns out there are actually analogs that we can look at. This is F. cuperi. This is a thrombolite from the Cambrian. This is also a microbial construction that also produces sheets. And in fact, we were able to actually build a 3D reconstruction to demonstrate that while the scale is totally different, so this is much larger than Namo Poike, which is much larger than any sponge in the rock record, the sort of features that we're talking about, which are the splitting and merging and the sheet-like curtains, those are there. So there is precedence for microbial constructions to build these ridges and then to build these sort of curtains. And really what needs to be done is much, much more work on microbial morphology because we just don't have that much to turn to when we try to understand whether a specific form was built by metazoans or microbes. There hasn't been that much work done on the morphology of, of microbial constructions. While there has been a lot of work done and I'm going to show you, it's sort of been lost. Great. So I've shown you that Claudina didn't build framework reefs, that Namapoikia wasn't a sponge and definitely didn't build anything associated with the framework reef. And it turns out that the Archaeocyathids likely are the first framework reef builders on our planets, on our, in our planet's history. And I told you I was going to show you some work that Ryan Manzik's been doing. So Ryan Manzik's still a graduate student, but he's been able to push this comparative morphology for the Archaeocyathids pretty far. What he's done is taken some samples of Archaeocyathids. We have A, B, and C up there. He's reconstructed them using our method, and then he's compared them to modern corals as well as uh, fossilized corals. And he's able to show that these branching angles are actually much narrower than what you see in, much, in corals today. That first of all, there is a upper limit to how much branching you might see, whether you look in deep time or you look in the modern. And that actually this branching probably has a lot to do with the way that these, that these sponges were pumping water around them. So unlike corals, they can be tighter because they are able to actively pump water through their systems. So that's really cool work. And I'm gonna spend the last two or three minutes just telling you about the sort of work I'm doing at UW now and the work that is actually has a larger astrobiological bent. 
And I'm going to return to my curvature immediate constructions and specifically this figure by Paul Hoffman. It was this figure plus the work on Namapoike that's really led me to be interested in what microbial morphologies or microbially mediated constructions, what their morphology tells us about the environment and the biology that produced them. And so in part, I focus on trying to understand microbially mediated constructions and their morphology. And really this work can sit in, in two avenues of, of research at the at AstroBio. One is just origin and evolution of life on earth. But also there is this bigger question of habitability and life in the solar system. And I'm going to say that because there are two points to keep in mind. First, these microbial immediate constructions, such as the schmalolites I've been talking about, serve as Earth's oldest fossils. These are the primordial constructions of our planet. They are the things that were first built on our planet, right? And because they're primordial constructions, it is likely that when we go to other planets and we sense and look for them, we might find them, right? So these might, one day we might be hearing about some sort of microbial construction that was seen in a photograph in a rover that on Mars. And in fact, you hear about this all the time. We just don't know whether they're truly microbial constructions or not, right? And that's why we have to consider two aspects. And these are the two aspects I'm really probing. First is the relationships between morphology and biological and physical forcings of microbial media constructions are completely quantitatively under constrained. So generally, if you talk to a sedimentologist, they'll tell you that, the, that microbial media constructions seem to change based on environmental setting. But there is no phase-based diagram that might look at something like light levels or water depth versus different morphological expressions of stromatolites. And that is an area of research that really can be worked on. Secondly, you can produce similar forms purely abiotically. So what I'm showing you on the right here isn't a set of stromatolites and a cross-section through stromatolites. This is actually an experiment done in an electrochemical bath. Essentially, all you do is you vary the amount of current. And as you deposit copper, it can produce these wildly branching forms that look like stromatolites in the rock record, purely, purely abiotically. And so how are we ever going to tell the difference between abiotic constructions and biotic constructions when we find them, whether on Earth or other planets? And so these are the major questions I'm after. And as a first step of this process, I've been working with Anders Larson Tevis, who's an undergraduate in my lab, and what we've been trying to understand is what have the descriptions of stromatolite morphogenesis been in the literature, right? So what Anders has been working on is just probing the literature, data mining the literature, to understand how many times stromatolite morphogenesis or stromatolite morphology is mentioned. And Anders has looked at four different sources. He's looked at uh, a paper by Hans Hoffman, a review paper from 1973. He's also looked at a book on stromatolites by M.R. Walter, edited by M.R. Walter from 76. And then he's looked at two modern sources, the web of science, right? So you can just go do some data mining, as well as XDD, which is Geo Deep Dive. This is a, a initiative out of the University of Wisconsin by Shannon Peters. And all Anders is showing in this plot is the number of publications relative to time. So a few things uh, pull out immediately. First of all, our modern databases are missing a lot of the stuff that existed back in the 70s. Secondly, one thing that Anders has found out is that if you go to Walter 1976, and you look at the percent of uh, publications that were in a foreign language, specifically Russian, it turns out that 20% of those publications were written in Russian. And the Soviet Union had this whole drive to understanding microbial media constructions of their morphology. That literature is more or less lost. If you look at modern day, you almost find zero references to that older literature. And so part of what we're interested in doing is, our, is using machine learning to actually extract some of that information from these older papers so that we might build measurements of stromatolites as described throughout the world and try to understand some of these ideas that may have been lost, right? So that is the initial building block of the work that I'll be doing here at the UW. All right, I just wanna point out that none of the work I do is by myself, right? So I have a lot of collaborators uh, and then specifically for this project, I have three collaborators, uh, both of these ediacaran organisms. Uh, and with that, I will take questions. Thank you. Okay, questions, Akshay. Okay, well, yeah. In the spirit of asking dumb questions, yeah. how do you decide which ones to destroy? Yeah. Did you, I assume you take more samples than the ones that yes. you actually destroy. How do you pick which one? You're like, it, are you going for the best quality one? Are you going for like some other 
I think that's a fantastic question. So, you know, generally when we pick the samples, we're trying to find things that look like they might be reconstructable, right? So when we're in the field, generally we take a lot more samples because we actually do other analyses. So I haven't shown any of my carbon isotope data. So we, we do a lot of other uh, secondary analyses. Um, typically what will end up happening is the samples I've been looking at largely are the same, no matter whether you take a rock from here or there, they basically are pretty homogenous. So it doesn't matter. When we've looked at other samples, like for example, we've looked at, uh, um, we looked at uh, pseudomorphs after certain minerals. We'll try to find the best pseudomorph because we think that's actually going to give us the most information, right? Um, and so there is this issue of whether or not it's representative and that's why you try to actually measure multiple, right? And so in the Claudina, actually we had four or eight samples that we reconstructed to do that. So are these all pseudomorphs or are there chemical and s features? So this is especially important on Mars. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, generally I've worked largely in carbonates and carbonates tend to be the further back you go in time, everything gets recrystallized. So there is actually a lot of, there's a lot of challenge in trying to find other things there. Um, I've become interested in actually looking at, at run and looking at a few other non-destructive techniques to understand especially in these microdigitate constructions of stromatolites, whether we can find precursors. So whether we can say, find precursors of, of clay minerals that might be the points that, you know, like these high magnesium clays in which these microbes actually first initiate and then produce the structures. And, and that's a sort of 3D chemical mapping that I'm interested in doing. And I have some samples from the pre-salt in, in Brazil where I'm doing exactly that, right? But uh, these are all open questions. The stuff I showed you today, I, I think those Claudina are true Metazoans, those worm guts prove it. The rest of it is microbial activity and it's we need other lines of evidence to show that, right? I've only merely suggested that they're not metazoans. That's as much as I can do at this stage. More questions? So I have a question. So, yeah. um, so what happened to Clydina? Why don't we have calcifying worms yeah. these days? Well, that's a good question. I mean, we do have worms that do build like, you know, that are building exoskeletons. Okay. So that's not totally gone. Right. But um, I don't know what, you know, Claudina went extinct, or at least that was the, uh, the general idea. Now people argue that Claudina actually made it across the boundary. There are into examples- the Cambrian, of, you mean? Yeah, into the Cambrian. So people argue that you can find stratigraphic sections where the Claudina are actually making it up. They sort of disappear. There's also the whole quote unquote arms race to consider once we get into the Cambrian. And there are some Claudina with boreholes through them. So that's usually the argument that's made for Claudina being sort of and what biology. And was boring into them? That's a good question. I have no idea. Right. We only know that the boreholes are there. And it becomes a bit harder when you start thinking, well, okay, we have boreholes, but everything looks like it's weakly biomineralized. It doesn't look like these are hard shells. So how does that work? And so these are open questions still. Have you thought about, um... You know, since you have this digital information, have you thought about 3D printing? So, yeah. for example, if you're going to do this, I would like an opabinia. An opabinia <laughs> is like a predator from the Cambrian that has five eyes and a trunk-like grabber. Yeah. It's a weird animal, <laughs> and it would be a great thing to 3D print. But you yeah, need to slice be... it first. <laughs> well, I think people have done at least reconstructions of it. Before. Yeah, they have. <laughs> but but if you actually did the slicing, you could do it precisely, presumably. Right, and that's one that they'll never let him slice because. Oh yeah, too precious. <laughs> but um, <laughs> but along those lines, people have started using these 3D reconstructions in uh, fluid dynamics models. Because the other question is, how do these organisms, if they are oriented? Were they actually creating these eddies in which they then can feed, right? So people, that's really the, the next logical step for these models once we reconstruct them. Exactly. Um, this is probably just a great, first of all, that was a great talk and it was beautiful the, the reconstruction. Um, possibly a crazy question. Is it possible to sort of validate um, your interpretation of some of these fossils by like using, I you know some of these other ones are extinct, but using some kind of like similar organism but like doing something in the lab where you yes. do, okay, could you talk about that? Yeah, sure. I can tell you that growing microbes is really hard as far as I'm concerned, but people have been working on these questions. I actually think, especially from a microbial construction standpoint, that is actually a very valid way to, to go about it. Whether or not we're going to get much more out of, say, these Claudina, whether there are similar analogs that we might extract, the work that I would point to are sort of, and the work that I read a lot of was Sue Kidwell's work on, um, on looking at 
large detritus piles, right? So trying to understand what happens to taphonomy, like what happens to these organisms after they fall into place and decay. And that's really looking at more modern organisms, but that's probably the, the closest that we'll get. For a lot of the Ediacaran, what people have started thinking about from the impression standpoint is actually like taking modern worms and letting them decay to see whether they can produce the same death mass that you might get out of those fine grain impressions, because we still don't even know how those impressions were formed, right? They're so delicate and they're so finely detailed. What was it? Was it seawater chemistry? Was it something about the organism? So those are even open-ended questions. So I think there's a lot you can do in that space. I had a question on your graph of the data mining yeah. for web of science and stuff. Yeah. I don't know whether you can go back. Oh to yeah, that. I can totally go back. So, so that's a weird curiosity. Yes. <laughs> yes. And yeah. Both in the blue one and the purple one. So like people go for ten years and then they get really bored. I think that's a thing. I think that's a thing. Artifact, right? And this is just work that Anders is just putting together now. Okay. But that's I think that's purely a binning artifact, and it might be the way that actually web of science and uh, geo deep dive make these decisions about where to put certain papers. I see. And it might just be a decadal issue here. Right. I, I don't think that's real. Uh, right. So that's that's not a like a yeah. lack of enthusiasm. Yeah. With, <laughs> with a it's not a cycle that goes yeah. on. <laughs> okay, any more? Yep. Um, it sounds like you mentioned that you were interested in using machine learning to try to mine the older Russian papers. Yeah. So you talk more about the methodology. Yeah, so there are two ways we can do this, right? So. Um, when Shannon Peters wrote Geo Deep Dive, uh, the whole idea of this project was that he was going to convince Elsevier and other publishers to give him all the data and then to build something where you could probe it. Um, and you could probe the literature as well. So that data set exists out there. The problem was where they got stuck was with natural language processing, and that just did not work well, right? Natural language processing is notoriously difficult to work with. And the advent of these large language models that have emerged are actually, that's probably the direction we want to go in. Uh, and these, you probably have heard things like chat GPT, but these models actually work really well for, for prompting and for asking these questions. What needs to be done is actually a whole bunch of work on validating the outputs. And so we really can't get there yet, but that would be the ultimate goal. And it turns out that natural language processing probably is not the way that we will solve these problems. And it really will be through these like much larger language models. Um, and so that's our ultimate goal. Anders will not be working on it. He has to do a GSA uh, poster for a Corey Aaron meeting. So he they will not be getting to it until well after uh, <laughs> after this spring. But that would be the ultimate goal. If anyone has ideas, the other thing we're really interested in are network analyses, so graph analyses. So what we really want to do is trace out individual citations and see when they become self-referential. It's really important for us to understand how lines of thought have evolved in stromatolite morphogenesis work. And so if anyone's had any experience with that, it would be great to talk. Uh, okay, let's let's go for Lucas first. Okay. Um, so you mentioned Mars. Uh, yes. I think it's going to be rocks you're trying to get Mars at some point uh, in the nearest future. Um, I'm guessing that would go into the category of things you're not allowed to do with the destructive. Um, yeah, not anytime <laughs> soon. But, you know, X-ray CT might do it. Yeah, I guess so. I was wondering, like, yeah, do you think there's room to grow the non-invasive versions of reconstruction. Like, will that catch up to more destructive? So the person to look at is Jim Schiffbauer over in Missouri. So he's having a lot of success working on phase shifting and, and thinking about um, looking at, at transitions within these X-rays so that you don't have to go to a synchrotron to do this work, right? So if you get enough high, high enough energy, you can find some differences here. But I think, I don't know if we're all, we're gonna get fully there. It all depends on whether or not the underlying rocks are recrystallized or not, whether the mineralogy has changed or not. Um, I still think that's a worthy first order thing to do, right? There's also a lot of stuff we can do just from 2D as long as we acknowledge that there are 3D errors, right? We can still measure the laminate. We can, you know, if, if someone returns something that looks like a microbial construction, we can measure the laminate. We can do a lot of Raman mapping or, you know, XRD mapping, we can do all that work and probably get very far, but we just have to acknowledge that maybe we're missing, we're looking at some random section, right? That's where I would come down on that. Anybody else? Thank you. Uh, you mentioned that they got a 20% microbial part of reconstruction, and I wonder if you have that many extension, like uh, how, how many will, 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 will,
Yeah, it's a good question. So I haven't looked at much of this. I have started pulling out, and this is all driven from even in grad school, I'd started looking at a lot of these old papers. And largely I was interested in how people have thought. So when I showed you all that stuff on like Namapoikia, actually there were Russian literature on these very specific forms, right? With images that actually look exactly like Namapoikia. So somewhere is in the 1970s, someone had already described something similar, right? Um, I'm ultimately after the images and the, the measurements that are in those papers, largely, because one major question about stromatolite morphogenesis is whether those lamination thicknesses are the same throughout time and whether they're the same in different locations. So people argue that they're always one millimeter thick. Well, I wanna know every place that anyone's ever measured lamination thicknesses, is that actually true? And when I go out into the field and then I go measure a bunch, are those the same variation or different variations, right? So that's what I'm after when I think about these things. Ideally, we'd have someone who actually speaks Russian to, or, you know, it's not just Russian, it's Indian, you know, it's Chinese. There are so many of these languages that that literature is happening in a space where I don't have access to it. And that's what we're after. I yep. didn't that myself, um, I you that, but wondering if you've done any analysis or like, I think that's a great question. I personally haven't done it. I know people are interested. I think the biggest thing here is maybe there are signatures of life that we might be able to extract from some of these rocks on a micro scale. That's where it'd be really interesting. There is this open question about whether or not rolling or sticky bacteria lead to different morphologies of stromatolites. So what we'd really need to do is actually identify what these organisms may have produced these different morphologies were. So that would be a, an avenue that'd be really interesting to follow, but I also have zero experience in it, so I'd need to work with someone. Okay, huh. Baptiste. This is the next one. <laughs> uh, that, was, that, was, that was good. The uh, what's how many how much data can we have right now about like the the transition from you know the bacterial mat to like structure building organism uh, and are we anywhere uh, close to being able to start to see uh, how did the transition happen and if we could make some conclusions that would be you know, useful for astrobiology, like for example, like what is like triggering yes. this complexification? I think that's a great question. So I have a potential postdoc coming and what she'll be working on is actually looking at structural complexity of microbial reefs to understand whether there's a step change at the Cambrian or whether it's a gradual change, whether it like corresponds with things such as the last uh, common ancestors of eukaryotes. So that's really like low hanging fruit, just what is the structural complexity of a 2 billion year old reef that's made up only of microbes? What's the structural complexity of something that has little vase shaped microfossils in it, but nothing else? And then what is the structural complexity of an Ediacaran reef right before we get into the Argosiapids? And I think with those three points, we might be able to start to say, is this a gradual change? Is it a constant such that as soon as microbes can produce aggregations, they do, and they're always complex? Does it have something to do with these sort of other life forms that might need to interact. And so that's really what we're after there. But so far, that's it's an open question. All right, well, it's the top of the hour. So let's thank uh, Akshay again. Thank you.